We're taking you to the city of Perugia in Umbria in northern Italy. Not so well known as Rome or Florence, but lovely to visit. Perugia is located 100 miles north of Rome, about a two-hour drive. It's in Umbria, a region just east of the more famous Tuscany. The main street of Perugia is this grand Corso Venucci. It's a wide pedestrian boulevard, and it's just one of the great streets of the world. Not too long, it's about a kilometer from one end to the other, and just wide enough that there's plenty of room for people streaming along or stopping and standing and talking, walking the dog, families out for a stroll. It's the gathering place of town. It's the location of the passeggiata when everybody comes out at 5 p.m. before dinner, buy the newspaper, have a drink, out for a stroll, see their friends, see their neighbors, perhaps make a new friend, and just generally be part of the fabric of the city. The old town has a network of narrow streets that are perfect for strolling. Some of them are for pedestrians only, and some have some automobiles, but the traffic is never terribly heavy, especially when you're on foot, and the whole town can be seen on foot. It's a compact zone. It makes a beautiful walk. There are lots of delightful side lanes off of the main Corso Venucci, that big pedestrian boulevard that runs through the center of Perugia. One of the oldest of these side lanes is the Via dei Priori. It was a major street back in the Middle Ages, and even today it's a very popular pedestrian lane. It goes down the hill with shops and bars and cafes along both sides of it. For the locals, it's all part of their outdoor living room. You'll find a variety of places to go strolling and exploring. Some of them are wide thoroughfares for shopping. Others are narrow that harken back to the medieval days, such as Via Bonazzi. This was a classic little lane winding along parallel to the Corso with hotels, with wine bars, little shops, just a couple of blocks long, but full of atmosphere. You might consider staying at the two-star Hotel Umbria, or perhaps go a little more upscale to the three-star Hotel Fortuna, a very charming spot with ivy-covered walls on this very quiet pedestrian lane, convenient wine shop right across the lane from it, and restaurants always nearby. But probably the most famous and perhaps the grandest of all is the Brufani. For over a century, this has been the number one hotel in Perugia. Four-star deluxe, beautifully located, right at the foot of the main street of town, easy walking into the pedestrian zone of the old town. It's right by the escalators that take you down to the parking structure and the train station. So it really is an ideal spot with a beautiful view looking out across the countryside as well. The restaurant in the Brafani Hotel is so good that you'll be tempted to have lunch or dinner here. Now, generally when you're traveling, you'll have breakfast in your hotel and you probably want to venture out into town and enjoy the restaurants, explore the cities of wherever you're staying. That's all well and good. But this restaurant is really worth considering. It was incredible. The Brufani is located right at Piazza Italia at the foot of the main Corso. And there's a beautiful park here, a merry-go-round. There's a lovely fountain in the middle, statue of Vittorio Emanuele Due, a nice view of sunset from our room. In the morning, we were delighted to find that a sports car rally was going on featuring a lot of historic and vintage sports cars. Machines designed to make driving fun. They've been maintained so well, they're like brand new practically. These Triumphs and MGs from the 1960s gave you much more control over your driving than we get today in our pampered modern machines. Going down this escalator will bring you back 500 years in the history of Perugia back to the time of Pope Paul III and his conquest of the city. The ruins of his castle have been renovated 
and are now open to the public as a living museum. In recent decades, an amazing transformation has happened to the foundation ruins of the fortress. They rediscovered the old buildings and walkways and streets that were still preserved underneath the ground, and they cleared it out 20, 30 years ago and did a lot of excavations and renovations and improvements, and it has now reopened as an underground city that takes you right back to the days of the Renaissance and Pope Paul. The whole section has been transformed into a series of galleries and rooms and public spaces and walkways, and it's all integrated into a large escalator system that brings you from the upper hill town to the lower parking structures and railroad station of modern Perugia. It's an amazing transformation and you can see it's a very popular place. It's very clean and well lit and all sorts of interesting sights to see in the midst of this original architecture. The escalators get you out onto the streets of the modern city and then when you're heading back up into the old town be sure to look for the sign. It's not all that obvious but the passageway leads you in and to the escalators and up you go. It's all free, no charge for using these extensive moving staircases. Saves you a big climb. The escalator takes you back up through the foundations of the fortress, a structure built nearly 500 years ago for the popes who used it as a control mechanism over Perugia. This fortress, constructed on the south end of the hilltop town, continued as the power center of various popes for the next 300 years. And then finally, it was ripped down in the 1860s with the unification of Italy. In recent decades, transformed into a cultural center and this escalator shortcut. This fortress called the Rocca Paolina, that's Paul's fortress, expanded over time and gradually a hundred other houses were knocked down to build the complete fortification. We leave by escalator and continue exploring. The Cathedral of San Lorenzo holds a commanding position in Perugia on the main square at the top of the main lane. And it dates back to 1345, but construction was halted and then finally completed in 1490. However, the external decoration was never finished. And so we have the big wall with its bare stone and brick still showing. The interior of the Duomo is quite large. The nave is 68 meters in length, and there are two aisles of the same height. The nave is twice as wide as the aisles, and you have a number of chapels all around the periphery. The apse is notable for its wooden choir and stained glass windows. There had been some paintings in here by Perugino and another native son, Pinturicchio, who lived in Perugia for a while, but those have been removed to several museums. There are still some beautiful statues and other paintings on display inside the Duomo. Whether or not you're religious, the inside of such a large cathedral is always a visual treat. And here we've got history. There's the burial of three popes inside the Duomo. It's a large, peaceful space. Along the outside, you find this grand staircase, which functions like um, a bleachers or an auditorium for the town itself. And there's also a loggia that dates back to 1423, an early Renaissance structure. There is a remarkable object in the middle of this main piazza, the famous Fountain of Perugia. It's attributed mostly to the Pisanos, Niccolo and Giovanni from Pisa, and it was constructed over 700 years ago from the year 1280. The fountain has three basins. The lower two are made of stone and the upper is made of bronze. And the lower one is quite extensive with many sides and empaneled with figures in bas relief. There are 50 sculptured panels running around this lower level and they were carved by Giovanni Pisano representing the months, the signs of the zodiac, prophets, apostles, emperors, kings, and some of Aesop's fables. These statues are important as representative of early lifelike Renaissance figures. 
Unlike the rigid Gothic sculptures that came before, these are lifelike beings in natural postures with faces that are beautiful and they're actually in motion. The uppermost small basin is made of bronze with nereids and a statue of the griffin, the dragon, which is a symbol of Perugia. In the evening, it's beautifully lit up and it's one of the earliest products of the Renaissance. The citizens were in the habit of declaring that their fountain was unique not only in Italy, but in the entire world. One of the main buildings on the primary square facing the Duomo is the Palazzo Publico, built from the 14th century. It was the home of the main government of Perugia, and today it's a museum and upstairs on the second floor, open to the public, go up that stone staircase and you go into a huge hall called the Room of the Notaries, Sala dei Notari. And it has a beamed wooden ceiling supported by eight great arches with wonderful restored fresco paintings depicting ladies and beasts and men and women and cavaliers and rows upon tourneys and very colorful with reds and yellows, and typical Tuscan decoration. You're also free to walk into the lobby, and there's a paid art museum if you like. Another small art museum is next door with paintings by Perugino. Although it's on the main street of town, you could easily miss this little museum. It's the Collegio del Cambio, the old chamber of commerce. And there are some real masterpiece paintings by Perugino still in place here. He painted them about the year 1500 for the Guild of Merchants. These decorative masterpieces are the product of the ingenious style of the early Renaissance, a beautiful series of frescoes on the walls and ceilings. With the decoration of this little hall, Perugino concentrated all his powers of invention. His real name was Pietro Vanucci, but he called himself Perugino based on his hometown of Perugia. From the main piazza, the 4th of November, in front of the Duomo, walk just a block west along the picturesque Via Maestà della Volte. It goes between two 16th century palaces, the Seminario and the Arcavolde. This is a remains of a vaulting that supported a hall of the medieval Palazzo del Podesta. And a little further along, there's a small red and white striped arch, all that remains of the Gothic portico. And you notice there's a fountain here. It looks like it's a typical medieval structure, but it was actually built in 1927. And this street leads on downwards to a magnificent view across the city. Looking down below to this pedestrian staircase, you get a sweeping view looking across the backside of Perugia. And notice the pedestrian lane branches off several ways and there's what looks like an aqueduct. That is an aqueduct constructed in the 13th century to bring water into the town and now converted into a pedestrian walkway. From this viewpoint, you can really see that Perugia is a city on a hill. And if you had time to explore, those distant lanes offer further rewards. Just walk along via Battisti and that will lead you to one of the great monuments of the city. It's the Etruscan Arch, also called the Arch of Augustus, the Roman Emperor. And you can look at three different periods of history in the gate. At the lower level, the Etruscan Foundation. The upper level is the Roman Edition. And up on top, we have a loggia that dates from the Renaissance. 3,000 years later, this gate still forms one of the entrances to the city. From here, walk up Via Bartolo. Noticing this renovation work done in the old fashioned way. These old clay tile roofs need a lot of maintenance. And then some beautiful views across the countryside open up as well. This will lead you back into the center of the old town, up to Piazza Ignazio Danti on the side of the Duomo. This piazza is not named for Dante, but Dante, who was a Renaissance scholar from Perugia, who worked as a mathematician and geographer 
for the church in Florence and in Rome. Entering this little piazza, you do see the actual front of the cathedral with a small door, and yet that's not the primary entrance, which is around on the side, facing the large piazza, November the 4th. Now you're back in the center of town, but it's time to see something different. Get away from the main corso and head one block to the east over to Piazza Matteotti. There are several wide pedestrian lanes that connect into the piazza, so it's very easy to find your way down there. And notice the intriguing split-level street off the north end, that Via Alessi curving around to the right and a staircase street coming down at you from the left. This is a beautiful public square, a wide thoroughfare. There's some cars, but mostly pedestrian zone. Of course, here you'll find shops and many more lanes branching off, leading you to further explorations. It's very easy to get back up to the Corso, the main shopping street, through these wide pedestrian lanes. You can zigzag back and forth. And don't hesitate to ask for directions, get some more tips. Stay safe. We took another little detour slightly downhill and gained some beautiful views across the old town and a lovely garden. It's quite a little spot and there was a surprise waiting for us through the arches. Perugia has an innovative rail transit system. You go down these escalators through the old medieval wall. It's remarkable how they're able to build a modern facility like an efficient escalator in the midst of this ancient structure. Great example of historic preservation and reuse. Down, down, down several levels until you reach what's called the Mini Metro. This is a subway rail line that goes for three kilometers down to the lower town below, a total travel time of about 11 minutes. And it connects people with the parking structures and with the modern city and the bus station and the train station. It costs one euro to ride it, there's no drivers. It's a very popular way to shuttle back and forth from the old town on the hill to the new city down below. And with the series of escalators, it makes it very easy to get from the old town down into the mini metro station. This is all part of the city's efforts to make the old town a pedestrian zone. Keep the cars down below and make it easy for locals and visitors to get down to the parking garage. Be sure to find this little Via Oberdon. It branches off from Piazza Matteotti. Narrow pedestrian lane, so classic, with your little boutiques and shops. There's little cafes nearby, and just a very quiet and peaceful part of town. Instead of eating during twilight, sitting indoors, and missing this beautiful time of the day, you might find greater enjoyment by strolling during this magic hour out in the streets. They're filled with locals and it's illuminated by this wonderful mix of lighting that it combines the golden glow of evening with sunset in the background along with the city lights and the shop lights. You've got fluorescent lighting and colored incandescent lighting. It's really a magical glow that goes on for about 30 minutes to an hour. And then we ran into a rock and roll concert outdoors in front of the cathedral, which really is no surprise because 20% of the population of Perugia are college students. Perugia is very much a university town. You see lots of young people out and about. The University of Perugia is a public college and it was founded as far back as 1308. It's got 28,000 students today and 1,200 full-time staff with a dozen different faculty departments, including agriculture and economics, engineering, medicine, and so on. It's quite a great university and one of the oldest in Europe. There's a second university in Perugia, the University for Foreigners, founded in the 1920s. And it was primarily a language school so that foreigners could come here and learn Italian. But it became a university in its own right and offers undergraduate degrees and master's degrees in a variety of courses. Makes a wonderful place to learn Italian while enjoying the ambiance of the delightful city of Perugia. We've gotten all the way through this movie without telling you any of the fascinating early history of Perugia. 
so here comes a one minute summary. The first civilization here were the Etruscans about 3,000 years ago, and they were conquered by the Romans about 300 BC. The locals tried to rebel against the Romans and Caesar Augustus came in and leveled the city at about 40 BC. And the Romans continued for another 400 years until the barbarians came in. They pretty much left Perugia alone. And then during the Middle Ages, Perugia became a regional power and the most important city in Umbria. There were frequent battles with other city-states like Assisi, Florence, and Siena. 14th and 15th centuries were good, great developments in the arts and trade and commerce. Then the popes took over for the next 300 years. With the unification of Italy in 1860, Perugia threw off the power of the pope and became one of the most important cities of the country. Today, as the center of Umbria, it makes a great place to visit. Beautiful in its own right, and an excellent home base for traveling out to those many other beautiful towns in the rolling countryside of Umbria in the north of Italy. We have got hundreds of more movies about Italy to show you on our YouTube channel. Take a look.